Hello and for person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the first ever discovery of what the scientists refer to as a rogue black hole. A black hole traveling completely by itself, without any partners, without anything. And as you can probably imagine, it would be pretty difficult to detect such an object. It does not emit any light, it does not produce any energy, such as any astrophysical gesture that would be visible to us, it doesn't emit anything. So the question is of course, how did they actually do it? And is it really there? And from what I've seen so far in the paper, it really seems like they did a pretty good job at making sure that this black hole is real. And it took them nearly a decade to actually prove all of this. And so it's a pretty groundbreaking study in that sense, especially considering that quite a lot of claims have been made in the past about the potential discoveries of these so-called black holes. But before I explain to you how they found this, it's also kind of important to understand why this is a big deal. Now naturally, black holes today are not really a mystery and nothing to be super excited about. They seem to be everywhere. As a matter of fact, not so long ago we've talked about this map you see right here. This is a map of millions of different black holes, very far away black holes, that was created by radio astronomers in Australia. The video for this should be somewhere in the description. But there are different types of black holes out there. And some are extremely elusive despite being very numerous. So for example, these ones, all of them, are supermassive black holes. Black holes that we normally find in the middle of a typical galaxy. Almost all galaxies so far seem to have them. There are some exceptions. For example, the Triangulum Galaxy, once again the video in the description. The scientists have also have been discovering a lot of binary black holes colliding and producing gravitational waves, something that the scientists have been doing since 2015. The example right here is from LIGO, showing us how these black holes produce these gravitational waves. This is also not something that's unusual anymore. And then there is also the discovery of several dozen systems, usually binary systems, where a black hole is absorbing some of the mass from its partner star and essentially is re-emitting it as astrophysical jets visible from planet Earth. Although these objects are not as common as some of the other black holes discovered so far. And the only reason we can even see them is because of the amounts of energy they release because of the mass being absorbed from the star. But there are obviously a lot of other similar black holes, at least in terms of mass, expected theoretically. As a matter of fact, most of the massive stars over approximately 20 masses of the Sun, when they explode, should be producing these uh, so-called stellar mass black holes. And considering the fact that we've seen quite a lot of supernova over the last few years that do end up producing black holes, usually in distant galaxies though, we generally expect a lot of these black holes to exist in the vicinity. But how would you possibly see them? For example, this black hole right here is just a few masses of the Sun in mass, and in terms of the diameter of the shadow of the black hole that you see right here, which is essentially the part that's blocking the light, it's really only possibly 15 to maybe 20 kilometers in diameter. And so if we look at this from a distance of several thousand light years away from us, it's practically impossible to detect this. So how did the scientists in this paper do it? Well, using a somewhat similar technique to how Arthur Addington that you see right here was able to use the 1919 solar eclipse to prove the ideas that Einstein proposed. The idea that a massive object is actually going to be bending the sunlight, or any starlight, just a little bit, assuming that it passes in front of the observer. In other words, it proved the ideas behind spacetime and behind the gravitational landing effects. And specifically, he was able to definitively prove that, as the title of this particular newspaper says, the stars were not where they seemed to be. In other words, the starlight itself shifted because of the gravitational effects during this particular solar eclipse. And this discovery then led to Albert Einstein becoming a somewhat household name. And what he did was use the technique known as astrometry, the extremely precise way of measuring the position of distant stars or any distant bright object, revealing their motion across the night skies or showing slight changes in their position. For example, it's possible to use astrometry to detect slight wobbles of stars' orbit, which could then indicate that there's some sort of a planet nearby. Or it can even be used to look at our own sun and determine these slight motions across the night skies, discovering where the center of mass of the entire solar system lies. So in this image you can actually see the year and the location of the center of mass of the solar system compared to our own sun. 
And so by essentially combining the idea of gravitational microlensing, which usually ends up producing a slight peak in brightness, as you can kind of see right here. This is due to the production of what's known as the Einstein lens, also sometimes referred to as the gravitational lens, that sort of resembles this. And by combining this idea with astrometry, which measures tiny, tiny variations of the star motion across the night skies, it becomes possible to essentially determine if something massive like a black hole passed in front of a distant object. And there are really only two expectations from a typical massive black holes when it comes to these observations. First of all, the actual gravitational lens has to be pretty long. As a matter of fact, the longer it is, the more massive the object is. But it also depends, obviously, on the speed of the black hole moving across the night skies. At the same time, the actual changes in astrometry, or the slight variations of the star location, and in this case we're talking about the starlight from several stars, also sort of signifies that something really massive passed in front of this region, and by measuring the actual shifts in the star location, or by measuring the astrometry, it becomes possible, combined with the gravitational lens, to determine the total mass of the black hole, the speed of the black hole across the night skies, and pretty much all of the other parameters, which are essentially the two methods used in this particular study. But they also needed to get data from somewhere, and it just so happens that in the last decade or so, two major projects have been collecting a lot of gravitational lensing data from a lot of different stars. We have OGLE, the Polish project that has already discovered quite a lot of various unusual objects, including several potential planets, and then we have the project known as MOA, Microlensing Observations in Astrophysics. Not as productive as OGLE, but still a pretty cool project nevertheless. And in June of 2011, there was an unusual brightening of a distant star located around 20,000 light years away from us. It was detected by both projects and was listed as this right here, with the star visible in this image, with the lensing effect producing the increase in magnitude visible in this graph. But this was just a gravitational lens, it did not include any astrometry. To get the astrometry data, very accurate astrometry data, they had to now look at the same location for several years using Hubble Space Telescope, which allowed them to confirm that not only did the star change in brightness as expected from the gravitational lens and did so relatively slowly, but there was also a relatively small shift in the astrometry position of these stars nearby with the actual changes in the astrometry being much, much smaller than what Arthur Eddington was able to detect in 1919, obviously suggesting that we now have much more sensitive techniques. And following the years of calculations and observations, the scientists determined that the best explanation here was a black hole that was approximately 7.1 masses of the Sun in mass, passing in front of a star at approximately 5,000 light years away from us, with the star itself being about 20,000 light years away from us. And in this case, they even determined the speed of the black hole. It was moving pretty fast, approximately 45 kilometers per second, compared to the stars nearby. But one of the main reasons they believe it's a black hole is really because of the length of this gravitational lens. It lasted for approximately 300 days, suggesting a relatively massive object. But here, the scientists also made some conjectures and some speculations about the potential origin of this black hole, simply due to its mass and due to its velocity across the night skies. Here, they believe that the supernova that produced this black hole might have ended up kicking it out of the actual system, giving it the necessary speed to move that fast. And that's mostly because of that high velocity. If it wasn't moving that fast, it could have actually been created in some other way. But I guess more importantly, this finally confirms that these solitary black holes definitely exist. They're very difficult to find, but they are definitely out there. And there's quite a big chance we're going to be finding more of them in the near future. Specifically, possibly in the next few years, possibly in 2025. And that's because in 2025, the iconic ESA's Gaia telescope is going to be releasing the astrometric data for billions and billions of star systems that it's been observing for several years now. Getting all of this data is going to be absolutely crucial for finding more of these mysterious black holes quietly traveling across the galaxy. Although I guess until then, this is definitely the first official confirmation of what's known as a rogue or free-floating black hole discovered to date. Definitely an exciting discovery, but so many more to come in the next few years. 
until we discover more or until some other updates in regards to this particular discovery, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.